Mark Oskerson from Permanent Revolution. Okay, how long have you got? Uh, we said about 20 for about 30. Okay, right. Um, well, first of all, thanks very much indeed for inviting me to speak to the Communist University um, again. I did last year, I enjoyed the experience very much, and I hope that we can have as good a debate um, this time around as we, as, as we did then, because I thought it was both productive, fraternal, and useful in taking forward the education of everyone here. So thanks very much indeed for that. Um, and what I want to try to do is to look at what I think are some of the key flaws in the way in which Mike, um, and in particular, in some of the articles in the Weekly Worker, Jack Conrad, have presented the question of the Marxist programme, and in particular what I think are some of the errors of the interpretation, and I stress it is an interpretation, I think a one-sided interpretation, of Trotskyism and the transitional programme. And I think the starting point for that has to be in a general sense, when Mike says, the, what is the program, why is it important for the party, it's in order to point um, the way forward for society as a whole. At a general and abstract level, everybody could agree on that. Um, the problem begins when you actually say, well, you know, in what way, in what direction, how do we move towards that? What are the stages and steps in the process of organizing fighting for the programme inside the working class movement. And this, I think, is where we begin to get problems, because I think fundamentally the difference, if you like, and I, I, you know, I want to be clear, I'm not saying this in any insulting terms, I'm trying to be scientific about it. I think the problem is, is the way in which the CPGB presents the programme, and in particular the defence of the minimum maximum programme, is a residue of its political traditions in Stalinism. Um, presented in a left way um, and presented with, as Mike made clear, you know, due recognition of the crimes of Stalinism um, in relation to the working class. But in its understanding of program, fundamentally tied to the errors that <coughs> Stalinism fostered upon the workers' movement. And I think most fundamentally, despite the fact that Mike talks about the um, society we want as being a product of the emancipation of the working class, being an act of the working class itself, I think if you look at the way in which the program is presented, that is a rather sort of abstract set of principles that the working class, separate from its everyday struggle, separate from its fights, um, can come to consciousness of through various means, means of education, means of you know, explanation, and whatever. All, if you like, a little bit presented separately from the actual tasks of the class struggle as it unfolds on a daily basis, in a whole range, and I want to stress, of political and economic arenas. And wh where that comes from, the predecessor, of the, where that leads to rather, is the predecessor um, of the weekly work of the Leninist, um, the newspaper that I uh, was, was fond of in its time. Um, and I don't know whether Dave remembers it, you know, from the days of the minor strike and the work when I was in Workers' Power that, that, that we did jointly with, um, with Dave and others in, uh, in, in the NUM. But fundamentally, I think the Stalinism, the unreconstructed Stalinism, which I think we've got to supersede if you're going to go forward, manifests itself from that understanding of the Marxist program as a fairly lifeless, fairly lifeless collection of principles. And where that manifests itself is in your attitude towards the Afghan revolution of um, 1976, the PDPA. So if you look at that, you know, what, what we see in the Leninist is they actually, despite all the warnings that Mike issued about the importance of the working class understanding the program and understanding itself, if the program is lifeless, the danger is you precisely end up in circumstances where those in the know, those who understand the program, become the manifestation of what is good for the working class. And 
difference between Trotskyism is and, and that is the Trotskyism. There's no, it has to be the working class itself. And in the Afghan revolution, that led quite clearly in the Leninist, number 64, for the archivists, or people with access to the research libraries that Mike talked about, which I don't have, by the way. I have a <laughs> card index system going back many years. It said the Afghan working class ruled Afghanistan through the PDPA. It was a product of the world communist movement, and in 1978, it was led by genuine revolutionaries who made a revolution. And I think that is fundamentally mistaken. And it flows precisely from the fact that this government certainly carried out the minimum requirements for the working class to enter government. It did carry out, it carried out land reform, it carried out the democratic republic, you know, in form only, in fact, that there were certainly no agencies of democracy. And I think that is, you know, gets to the heart and soul of it. If you leave the program at that level, if you leave it as, you know, a, a, a collection of principles divided into a minimum which provides the basis for, um, and Mike's interpretation of the minimum program was, was novel, to say the least, in terms of it um, being the program for the overthrow of capitalism essentially the overthrow of the capitalist state at least. Um, if, if you leave it at that, what you leave out of the picture in terms of the program is the way in which the goals of the maximum program, socialism, the abolition of private property, all the things that I agreed with in terms of uh, what Mike was saying, you leave out how you move towards that in real life by mobilizing the working class for struggles that connect those struggles with those objectives. Left out completely, not explained, not presented in the way that I think Trotskyism did eventually successfully begin, and I'll say no more than that, begin to present it as a bridge, you know, the program as a bridge from the everyday struggle to the struggle for, um, for, for, for working class power. So in the sense, for, you know, for, for, for certainly speaking for, for myself and, and I think probably all the comrades of per permanent revolution but fairly open about whether or not there are disagreements on that and people can register the disagreements. But for us, it is wrong, therefore, to explain the program in the rather rigid way that I think Mike explained it and to um, confer upon the minimum maximum program the you know, the blessing of the Marxist program and counterpose that to the 1938 transitional program. For us, it's neither, you know, the Marxist program, the minimum maximum program, um, as you call the Marxist program, nor is it the 1938 transitional program as the last word on the subject. Because if that was the last word on the subject, I think we would be in serious trouble because there were serious mistakes within it. Um, but as well, um, there were serious mistakes in virtually every credible, authentic, and broadly correct Marxist program ever produced, going back to the Communist Manifesto, right through to the draft program of the French Workers' Party, and so on and so forth. So what I think our approach is, when we look at program, is there isn't this thing called the Marxist program that exists in a in a fixed form, although I accept and I've seen, I've you know, looked at the uh, developments and whatever that the CPGB has put into the, um, their own draft program, I, mean, I accept that you don't you know, say that's it, you can't, can't develop. But the basic form, the basic idea of it is, is fixed. And I think um, I prefer to go with Trotsky, um, who did precisely recognize that the program is a thing that has to be constantly refined, re-looked at in the way that you know, the uh, Communist Manifesto was. And if you look at Trots what Trotsky actually said when he um, wrote his essay on um, 90 years of the Communist <coughs> Manifesto, revolutionary thought has nothing in common with idol worship. Programs and prognoses are tested and corrected in the light of experience, which is the supreme criterion of human reason. The Communist Manifesto, too, requires corrections and additions. However, it is evidenced by historical experience itself 
as is evidenced by historical experience itself, these corrections and additions can successfully be made only by proceeding in accord with the method lodged in the foundation of the Communist Manifesto itself. And there, while I say you know, the 1938 programme is in need of re-elaboration re re constantly, its errors need correcting, I do say that the fundamental method that it contained was an advance for the Marxist movement on the, a dramatic advance on the minimum maximum programme. Now, if you look at, um, to, to sort of approach it negatively first, if you look at Jack Conrad's um, elaborately named article, Programmatic Masks and Transitional Fleas, um, which you know, shows that someone somewhere needs a crash course in sub-editing to get rid of headlines like that in any paper. But if you look at um, the, the, the article, you see it, it doesn't, I think it's a poor article in the sense that it doesn't actually take to task the transitional programme on um, some of the errors that it is actually um, guilty of. Instead, I think it attacks a number of imaginary errors in order to defend the minimum maximum program. First of all, it, in my opinion, um, very wrongly, conflates the opportunism of the various fragments of Trotskyism that emerged after the Second World War fragments who, in my opinion, were guilty of standing and developing positions that were in complete contradiction to the method of the transitional program. It conflates the likes of the SWP, uh, the Socialist Party, and the, what I would characterize as the abandonment of the transitional method by such people. It conflates the opportunism of those people with the method of Trotskyism itself. It doesn't prove that conflation. That's what it does. It suggests that the concept of the transitional demand, as developed by Trotsky, is responsible for the sort of hoodwinkery that took place in the development of the Socialist Alliance's program, um, People for Profit, um, which I, I, I think is, is wrong. Secondly, it ignores the proviso that was lodged within Trotsky's program, and certainly if you take the time to look at the discussions around the program, um, one of the most sort of um, incorrect elements of Trotsky's program was its prognosis. Um, it was an understandable prognosis, rather in the same way as Marx's in 1848 was understandable on the eve of the 1848 revolutions, that everything was you know, going to come to a head and it was all going to blow up and everything was going to be fine because we triumphed. And Trotsky posed it the same way in terms of productive forces stagnating and decaying, crisis of leadership, um, absolutely decisive, um, and mass struggles on the horizon that would compel the masses to um, the struggle for power in the relatively short term. Now, why I think that's understandable is because we shouldn't sit here and judge it from our own you know, comfortable position in the Sapal Ram room, but judge it from the fact that the world was dominated by fascism, um, war was on the horizon, China had been involved in civil war, there were um, national liberation struggles on a truly momentous scale, and the era of the Great Depression had seen strikes in the United States, for example, which had actually directly challenged <clears throat> for the first time if you like, on a nationwide scale, the power of the US corporate bosses during the great 1937 sit-down strikes. So you had a situation from which Trotsky's prognosis was entirely understandable, um, if, with the benefit of hindsight, you can say it was wrong. But Trotsky himself, in the discussions of the transitional program, added the proviso. He said, our program is a program for advance. If capitalism recovers, either thanks to the reserves that exist within itself, because he recognized, like Lenin, that no crisis of capitalism is the final crisis of capitalism, unlike that program there, which was to uh, be the program for the third period and the final crisis of capitalism. Trotsky, like Ren Lenin, recognized, uh, and I've got a copy, by the way, so that's two, so we can pass them around. <laughs> 
Um, mm. he, he recognized that there was no final crisis of capitalism. He said, if as a result of its reserves or as a result of the misleadership throwing back the struggle and creating either the circumstances of a fascist or democratic counter-revolution, um, in, in most parts of the globe, then we will have to reorder, reorient, re-elaborate our program and prepare for a strategic retreat. That's what Trotsky said, in relation to his own program. He said, however, and here he was no, doing no more than any revolutionary, because any revolutionary that goes into a struggle without preparing for retreat, but actually fighting for victory, you don't do it the other way round when you go into struggle. You don't go in and say, right, we're going to prepare for a victory just in case, but let's go for it in order to get a defeat. You don't do it that way around. Programmatically, you, fight, you, you orient yourself towards the goals of victory. And that's what Trotsky was doing, although he recognized and built in the proviso that that might not happen. Thirdly, I think, um, and Mike, I think, was um, teetering towards this, although not so nakedly, um, as Jack Conrad in, in, in the article, was suggesting that economic demands equal economism. Now, nothing could be further than the truth. Economism is not the fight for economic demands. Economism is the tailing of the economic struggle of the working class in the belief that it can generate spontaneously class political consciousness. That's what economism is. It's a form of reform. <coughs> it is not the fight for economic demands because as Marx recognized in his instructions to delegates very early on, the fight for an economic demand, the 10-hour day, was the first act of the working class, the first victory of the working class as a whole against the capitalist class. It was an economic demand that Marx itemized as the first political victory of the working class over the ruling class. So a fight for an economic demand, an emphasis in circumstances of the decade of the Great Depression, of economic crisis, turmoil, etc., an emphasis on the importance of economic demand is not, as I think Jack Conrad, and to a lesser extent, might presented it, somehow um, you know, a downgrading of the importance of politics. You find plenty of political demands in the transitional program and in other key programmatic documents, um, or um, e economism. And I think this linking of it all with regards to um, Bakunin and um, the sort of, you know, well, if, if Marxism's the red thread, I'm not quite sure what color Bakunin is, I suppose, you know, black, black, <laughs> and, yeah, although not quite, you know, not quite. Um, a bit black and a bit of red. It's got a strange twine that's, go that's going around. Um, the idea that you know the transitional program is guilty of this elitism and spontaneism, and that somehow propaganda of the deed will propel the masses short of having a party um, and all the rest of it, just isn't lodged within the transitional program at all. It's not an issue in the transitional program. Indeed, by recognising the centrality of the crisis of leadership, and if anything, I would potentially criticise the transitional programme for a sometimes mechanical reduction of what that term is. I'd certainly criticise the um, post-war followers of Trotsky for reducing that to a rather, you know, um, it becomes a rather in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost approach to political leadership. So as long as you stick on at the end of every article, and that's why we need a new leadership, you solve the question of the Revolutionary Party. Um, no, but Trotsky himself recognized, by recognizing that crisis of leadership, that without the development of and the building of a party that could lead the working class in the struggles that he predicted were coming, then it wouldn't happen. So he wasn't downgrading the party. If you look at what he says, he says the strategic task, not the ephemeral, not the momentary, not the tactical, and not the, you know, just for today and we'll see how we feel tomorrow task, but the strategic task of the next period, a pre-revolutionary period of agitation, propaganda, and organization, consists in overcoming the maturity of the objective revolutionary conditions and the immaturity of the proletariat and its vanguard, the confusion and disappointment of the older generation, the inexperience of the younger generation. And he was posing there the question of how how practically in these circumstances do we build 
a revolutionary party that can take the struggle forward. And I think, in that sense, Jack's got it all wrong in his article, and I think the critique that was echoed, I think, to a, to a slightly different extent by my, by my misunderstands what we were doing with regards, what, what the transitional program was trying to do with regards to the minimum maximum program. And I think the, prob the other problem is, is that it suggests that it was all the product of Trotsky um, in 1938. And, oh, oh you know, Trotsky, Tia Platoon, and whatever. I don't think that's the, the, the case at all. You see, if you look at the minimum and maximum program, not at what Mike has described as his minimum maximum program, but at the actual minimum maximum program, which is probably best represented by the Earth Earth program. And you can all, oh, sugar butty, good job it was a top on that. Um, but that's what you get to support the minimum maximum. Um, <laughs> if you look at the, <laughs> if you look at the, um, the Earth Earth program, probably the most developed, probably the clearest, probably one of the best examples of the minimum maximum program. Certainly, you know, pre predating Kautsky's, um, you know, um, sort of refinements, which I, I think Mike makes a very good point about some of the ways in which Kautsky refined it. Um, although I don't necessarily agree that the problem was his recognition of the importance of. Um, so that's quite the reverse, actually. I think you know the abolition of the stages, the rigid stages of democratic revolution and proletarian revolution, were an advance for Marxism, one that Trotsky summarized in his theory of permanent revolution. But what I think is wrong with the uh, minimum maximum is not this or that demand in it, nor the idea that the minimum program contains you know, a series, the actual minimum program, the actual Earth Earth program, contains a series of demands which, you know, if for for in their entirety, certainly could provide the conditions in which the capitalist state could be undermined. What I think you ignore in real life is not Kautsky's theoretical refinement of the minimum maximum program, but alongside the piece of paper, the program, the material evolution of reformism as a real force inside the working class that was able to take, use, and emasculate the minimum program and turn it in a completely different direction from that originally envisaged by Marx. Now, does that mean that we can simply go back to the one of Marx? I don't think so, because it wasn't only Trotsky who began to understand that by enforcing a rigid separation corresponding to the rigid separation of the stages of the revolution, the democratic and the socialist stage, by reflecting that division, the development both of reformism and of the imperialist epoch and the changed tasks that are presented in revolutionary terms, enforcing that division was handing the initiative to the reformers. It was enabling them to say, in the conditions that we find ourselves in, the minimum we can fight for is and the maximum we can wait until, as Kautsky will talk it, one day, you know, the, mecha the mechanical thinking of the Second International, the, you know, one day capitalism will collapse, and, you know, the maximum program, without any struggle, without any worry, without, you know, anything at all, would happily land in our lap. And I think that is what is fundamentally wrong with the di divide that you're accentuating today. Now, was it Trotsky? who began the critique of that. Was it Trotsky? Bring back Becoming. No, it was Engels. Engels, in the, his critique of the Earth Earth program, said, this forgetting of the great, the <coughs> principal considerations for the momentary interests of the day, this struggling and striving for the success of the moment, regardless of later consequences, this sacrifice of the future movement for its present, may be honestly meant, but it is and remains opportunism. And honest opportunism is perhaps the most dangerous of all. He recognized that this opportunism lodged within the minimum maximum program that was being used by the development of, you know, of reformism. Rosa Luxemburg, our program is deliberately opposed to the standpoint of the Earth Earth program. 
It is deliberately opposed to the separation of the immediate so-called minimum demands formulated for the political and economic struggle from the socialist goal regarded as the maximal program. In this deliberate opposition, we liquidate the results of 70 years of evolution and above all the immediate results of world war in that we say for us there is no minimum and no maximum program. Socialism is one and the same thing. This is the minimum we have to realize today. Now, Luxembourg didn't develop the program in order to place socialism, the maximum <coughs> program, on the agenda of the class struggle as an immediate practicable outcome of the day-to-day -day class struggle, because she was killed and wasn't part of the debates that sort of developed it. But if you look at the Comintern, the Comintern, not Trotsky, advanced the idea of linking the struggle, organizing the struggle around a series of immediate demands, which in their entirety could topple capitalism. The communist parties do not put forward any minimum program to strengthen and improve the tottering structure of capitalism. The destruction of that structure remains their guiding aim <coughs> and their immediate mission. But to carry out this mission, the communist parties must put forward demands whose fulfillment is an immediate and urgent working class need. And they must fight for these demands in mass struggle, regardless of whether they're compatible with the profit economy of the capitalist class or not. And there you can see the beginning of the development of what Trotsky took to its highest level. You can see the beginning of the development of the transitional method as a bridge between the immediate struggle of the working class, both political and economic, both in the German Revolution, you know, the democratic demands that were concretely posed, alongside the economic demands. In other words, the new task posed in the era of the First World War and the Russian Revolution of 1917 wasn't how do we fight for the minimum program on the one hand and how do we fight for the maximum <coughs> on the other. It was how are the two linked? How are the two bridged? What means do we have of bridging them? And Lenin, you know, not Trotsky, Lenin said, and here we come to the question, I think he was right, I think he posed it in a good way. Here we come to the question of whether we should abolish the difference between the maximum and minimum programs, yes and no. In place of the minimum program, we shall introduce the program of Soviet power. Now, in that sense, Lenin wasn't saying, you know, raise the program of Soviet power, take it or leave it. He was getting, and all the programmatic debates of the early Comintern were getting at the heart of how does the party fight for its program in a working class that is mobilized in a whole series of revolutionary situations. And I'm afraid that's left out of the considerations that I've seen in the um, presentations, both of Mike and in, in the writing of writings of the, um, of, of, of the uh, CPGB and, and the Weekly Worker. So to bring it together, what is therefore, if you like, the method of the transitional program? Why do I think it's superior to the way in which it's been presented? I think the point about the transitional program is it takes those debates that took place from you know, angles on the Earth Earth program right the way through to the common turn, in which, by the way, some of the most interesting debates, and I'd urge those of you with you know, library and research cards to go and look them up, are actually in the pages of the Communist International Journal during the debates on program that took place prior, much prior, many years prior to that. That was 1928. Stalinism was in power by 1928. Um, the programmatic debates of the first four congresses, which are published in the Comintern's journal, show you that the architects of the transitional method were the German communists. The German communists who were most acutely faced with, you know, un, un, um, unlike the Bolsheviks at a decisive moment where Menshevism was collapsing, except in certain areas of the working class, they were the communists in Germany faced with a mass social democrat led working class that was nevertheless engaged in struggle, were posed with the question of how do we you know, take that struggle forward and link it to the struggle for power. And transitional demands, what Trotsky sums up, are that they are a means of bridging. Building a bridge is the simplest way to think about it. 
building a bridge from the immediate struggle, be that the struggle against the monarchy, or be it the struggle over wages, over hours, or whatever, whatever the area of struggle, they are a bridge that take the working class towards the program of Soviet power, towards the fight for political power. They seek to mobilize the working class that does struggle around all sorts of issues on an everyday basis. And while I wouldn't say that the working class can only learn and only develop consciousness in conditions of struggle, something that I think would be a very arrogant thing to say, um, that it could only do it in conditions of struggle, I do nevertheless think based purely, if you like, and I don't care what science is based on, but based on years of experience, workers learn faster and harder when they are engaged in struggle. And the circumstances of struggle you know, are ones that create the sharpest contradictions with capitalism, and that's what we're about. We're about developing and extending those contradictions, undermining capitalism through the fight for the revolutionary program. And transitional demands are a bridge towards that. Why? Because, if you like, at the heart of them, whether they represent you know, a political struggle or, at, or, or, a, um, you know, or an economic struggle, they pose something very, very fundamental. They pose the question, if they're you know, articulated in the way that I think Trotsky tried to articulate them, they're posed at the, the question of control. Who controls who at the heart? Do the capitalists control us, or do we assert our, our control over the capitalists? Irrespective of whether or not a particular demand can be fulfilled at any one time, does it does it, if you like, encapsulate within itself the struggle for a priority of the working class, control of the working class, over control of the capitalist class? And does it encroach directly upon the rule of capital? And I think, again, you know, in a transitional program, a very good transitional program by Lenin, the impending catastrophe and how to combat it, which was written on the eve of the of of the Russian Revolution and forms, if you like, a prototype. Lenin said, in point of fact, the whole question boils down to who controls who, i.e. which class is in control and which is being controlled. We must resolutely and irrevocably, not fearing to break with the old, not fearing to boldly build the new, pass to control over the landowners and capitalists by the workers and peasants. Now that fight for control, that workers' control, is at the heart of the transitional program in 1938. It's at the heart of the transitional method. And it explains why what Trotsky was doing. It doesn't surprise me that there was, you know, if you like, um, a sort of greater emphasis on trade union struggles. I mean, you know, um, I think it'd be extremely dangerous. Um, and sectarian, actually, to, to dismiss the centrality of the trade unions and the trade union struggles. I mean, it was, you know, Engels went as far as to describe them as the working class organisations that exercise, you know, the, uh, the, the by, by which means the, um, the working class is really organised as a class. Now, I think that was only under certain conditions, but certainly the importance of them is not something I'd underestimate. Um, and I certainly wouldn't be disdainful of them because of the tendency lodged within them towards sectionalism, because, of course, there are counter-tendencies. I think that's another problem of posing it abstractly. There are tendencies towards solidarity, towards the collective spirit, towards uniting workers from different sections. Many trade union struggles pose those, you know, pose those class, um, class-wide sort of questions in relation to the struggle. Um, and the emphasis on them is a product of its time, a product of Trotsky's circumstances in the US at the time. But I think the importance about them was that he did not suggest anywhere at all in the program that somehow this entire process was going to be um, carried through spontaneously by the unions themselves, but that a fight for a new revolutionary party was, uh, was crucial. It was simply the case that the new revolutionary party 
you know, couldn't wait until it had formed itself before fighting for and advancing um, its, you know, its, its, its program. And I think the Fourth International, to the best of their ability, and that ability was highly limited because of the historical circumstances, but they did do that. They attempted to address the crisis of leadership, <coughs> attempted to build um, a new revolutionary party, attempted to take the struggle for the maximum program forward by advancing and fighting for a transitional program in which the issue of control was at the heart. And by ignoring that, by taking us back to the minimum maximum program, reinterpreting the minimum maximum program in the way that Mike, Mike did, um, and packaging it as though it's a solution, I think the danger is, is that you get left with the separation of struggle from consciousness. By counterposing the two in the way you do, you, you separate them. And if you do that, then the revolutionary organization ends up not as the tribune of the people, engaged in each and every struggle of the working class, but as a rather dry, you know, <coughs> um, leather patches on, on sleeves, sort of, you know, dusty and musty school teacher telling the working class, you know, rather like London cab drivers, we have the knowledge, and until you've been round every street with, you know, the programmatic equivalent of our map on your motorbike, you know, you're not going to get there. I think, you know, the transitional program mobilizes the class for action as best it can and takes the class towards the struggle for socialism, and as such, I think it's preferable to the minimum maximum. Thank you. I'm not going to film the contributions. <laughs> <laughs>